Good evening and welcome to Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight we take a look at the long-term sustainability of Arizona's water supplies. The state already has some of the strongest water conservation laws in the nation, but experts agree that our current laws don't go far enough to protect Arizona's water and ensure that we have enough water to meet our future needs. That's why the governor's blue ribbon panel on water sustainability was formed. It includes about 40 expert stakeholders in Arizona's water future. The goal? To find ways to increase Arizona's water sustainability through recycling, reuse, and conservation. The panel is co-chaired by the director of the State Department of Water Resources, the chair of the Arizona Corporation Commission, and Arizona Department of Environmental Quality Director Ben Grumbles, who used to be in charge of national water programs for the EPA. I, I love the saying that there is no wastewater, just wasted water, wasted opportunities. Honestly, I, I think the, the solution is is uh, multi-layered, but it's basically the three R's. Uh, not reading, writing, arithmetic, but reducing, reusing, and restoring. Reducing waste and inefficiency. Reusing water, really recycling that wastewater and gray water, and storm water, and restoring watersheds. And it takes a combination of tools, technology, innovation, collaboration, public acceptance, but the key to sustainability is, is working those those three R's and bringing uh, the public along and making sure the public truly accepts the value of water and understands it. Here to talk about water sustainability is our own panel of experts. Sharon Megdahl, director of the University of Arizona's Water Resources Research Center and a member of the Blue Ribbon Water Sustainability Panel. Rita McGuire, a water law attorney and former director of Arizona's Department of Water Resources. And Tom McMahon. Tom McCann, excuse me, an assistant GM of operations, planning and engineering for the Central Arizona Project. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Let's, uh, Sharon, we'll start with you. Uh, where do we get our water? We get our water from a number of sources, primarily groundwater for about 40% statewide, surface water for the rest, and that comes either along the Colorado River through the Central Arizona Project from the Colorado River into Central Arizona from the Salt and Verde rivers and other rivers, and then a tiny bit of our use is actually reused water, reclaimed water, that's treated wastewater. Uh, how are, what is being done to ensure that that water stays there? I mean, a lot of people think we're running out of water in Arizona. No, that's not correct at all. In fact, we're incredibly blessed. We have huge supplies of groundwater in the aquifers beneath us, and we have substantial rights to the Colorado River, and then the Salt and the Verde River system also provide quite a bit of water. So Arizona is very fortunate among the states in the Southwest. So, so Tom, if, if people are saying that water rationing and, and these sorts of things, that's got to be in Arizona's future here, and maybe even the near future, you say not necessarily? Someday, but not soon. Um, and even if it is soon, the impacts won't be felt by your average homeowner. Um, we get, uh, when we go into numbers, 2.8 million acre feet of water off the Colorado River. We've been in a drought for 11 years, but our reservoirs on the river are still more than half full. A lot of people want to point at that and say that things are bad, but we look at it that they're doing their job. We're in good shape off the river. We're prepared for shortage if it comes. Today, if we had a shortage, the primary impact would be to our underground storage, our, our recharge, our banking that we do every year. So it's not going to affect uh, the homes in central Arizona at all at this point. Status of CAP water then is strong. It is. Status of groundwater in Arizona, strong? Well, I think it depends upon where you're talking about. And in many cases, we don't even know how much groundwater there is. So one of the things that we need to work on is making sure we quantify groundwater resources in different parts of the state. And then in other parts of the state, it may be plentiful, but the purpose of the Groundwater Management Act is to ensure that we don't overdraft it and don't overuse it, and that we're on a sustainable water supply for the future. And so we're, we're not uh, out of the woods in terms of having sustainable water practices yet, but our law is um, in force trying to get us there. And then in other areas of the state, we still have some work to do. Do you see that as well, that different parts of the state have different concerns? And, and to that end, the groundwater management laws obviously deal with certain aspects of, of the state. Um, uh, the impact of those laws, good for Arizona? 
Good. Uh, and it is important to talk about the places where there are very stringent uh, um, regulations with respect to access to groundwater, and those are in active management areas. Eighty percent of the state's population resides in those active management areas. So if you're looking for the biggest bang for your buck, having the Groundwater Management Act in place in those highly populated areas is a very smart thing to do. But in rural Arizona, we have two problems. One, we have limited regulation of groundwater. And two, we don't have a lot of data about the groundwater basins. We need to know more about the surety of the water supply, uh, the, the quality of that water supply, and building the infrastructure to deliver it. Are wildcat wells still a concern in those areas? Absolutely. Uh, wildcat wells are prolific around the state. Yavapai County, one-third of the water provided to residents in Yavapai County comes from exempt wells. That's code talk for being totally unregulated. They're predominantly located near the Verde River. They have a very real effect on the flows in the Verde River system. Something uh, regarding CAP water, a concern is that we go through cycles, I guess 20 to 30 year wet cycle, dry cycle, these sorts of things. Obviously in a dry cycle right now, how much do you plan for that? How much does weather forecasting come into play? It's not so much weather forecasting, but uh, certainly looking ahead, climate change is the thing that everybody wants to talk about. And so what it means for us is looking at a broader range of future alternatives. We're, we're looking at what happens if, if uh, what they say is true and the flow of the river declines and there isn't as much there for us on a year-to-year -year basis, or what happens if it's not true. We need to be ready either way, and I think we are. Uh, we've been storing water, as I said, underground for many years. We're well prepared to recover that water in time of shortage. Uh, and we're looking at new supplies, too. The concept of, of being ready in case shortages should occur, whether by nature or other aspects, Arizona ready for this? Oh, I think at the current uh, point, we are. Um, I think we've done some great planning for shortages. We have an or organization, Rita Hill Create, the Arizona Water Banking Authority, that's been storing millions of acre feet of water underground for the eventuality. Where our challenges are, I think, in the longer term. I think as people think about our planning and our supplies, we have plentiful supplies for the people here, but we're still growing. And it's at that increment, at that edge of, of where are we going to get the supplies to meet the growing demands. I think that's where our challenge really is. Okay, more on that in a second. Uh, reusing and conserving water is what Global Water is all about. It's a private water company that owns about 16 water treatment and distribution facilities across the state. Producer David Major and photographer Scott Olson show us what the company is doing to reuse wastewater in the, the town of Maricopa. Of growth and the certainty of declining water supplies will eventually come to a crisis here. I'm trying to get ahead of that. Trevor Hill is president and CEO of Global Water, a leader in reusing wastewater. In the town of Maricopa, it recycles about a third of the two billion gallons of groundwater its customers use in their homes each year. Wastewater from those homes is collected and treated to a very high quality. Then in purple pipes, it's returned to common areas of the town for limited outside uses. So all the gr grass, and school grounds, and boulevards, and things that make the community nice to live in and green, they're all supplied with recycled water. About 700,000 gallons of water are recycled each year, and some of it's pumped back into the ground. The next step is to take it all the way to the home. So all your outside uses in your home, and car washing and things of that nature, are all, are all uh, picked up by recycled water. Beyond that, we can flush toilets and urinals with recycled water, like we do in this building. Of course, the ultimate question is whether we'll ever be ready to drink or cook with treated affluent. Here in the, in the industry, the technical answer to that question is we're very close to drinking water standard. The public, the public perception is that we're a long, long way away. And my theory has always been, uh, if you do this planning early enough, and you get as many non-potable uses uh, tied to recycled as possible, you don't have to make the, the bridge to drinking recycled water any time in our lifetime. Hill wants lawmakers to issue a mandate. Put the infrastructure in at the beginning to distribute recycled water. Where practical, he thinks new development should be required to install those purple pipes needed to deliver treated wastewater. Hill says it may increase costs 20 to 25 percent, but it can cut potable water use as much as 50 percent. Because we're not in an absolute knockdown crisis today, 
there isn't the political will to make the tough decisions. It all comes down to economics. A little bit more today for some thoughtful planning or three or four times as much when you're in crisis mode. And that day is probably within the decade, in my opinion. Sharon, what do you make of what we just saw? Do you agree with that? Well, in part. Um, I think it's important that people recognize that treated wastewater, reclaimed water, is a supply that's available to us. It's being produced every day, and it should be used wisely. And I think Trevor Hill talks about that, how it can be used. I think Ben Grumble's talked about that. And it's our, our next obvious supply. We're growing into our Central Arizona Project water. We're fully allocated with our uh, Salt River Project water. So this is our future supply. But I think an important aspect that Trevor touched on is let's match the quality of the water with the need. And so let's not use high quality potable water for outdoor watering, but maybe slightly lesser quality. And, I, and so I would agree with that uh, quite strongly, actually. Want to add to that? Well, there's a fun saying about effluent, that uh, effluent is the one water supply that grows with the population. And 10 years ago, cities couldn't give away their effluent. They were looking for ways in which to use the water supply. Just recently, the city of Flagstaff substantially increased the cost of effluent to their customers. And I think that's a real reflection of the value of effluent today and the fact that it is a highly sought after commodity in an era of scarcity. Talk about, uh, uh, can we talk about technological advances in reusing water? Is, is that is that a uh, science that is increasing, improving all the time? Absolutely. In fact, a few years ago, uh, Southern California tried to implement a program called Toilet to Tap. People weren't quite ready to <laughs> <laughs> uh, buy into that concept. Nevertheless, there are communities in New Mexico as well as Southern California that are currently drinking basically highly treated effluent. And you can do that. You can bring it to drinking water standards. So, so. In Orange County, they take their treated effluent, they store it underground, recharge it right back into the ground, and then pump the groundwater up and deliver that. So it's only one step away from um, direct potable reuse. One step away, but still needs to be conserved is what I'm hearing from you. Well, we need to conserve water, whatever water source it is we're using. And with the treated wastewater, um, right now we don't have a plan to utilize it, and we have to consider the full range of options, clearly the technology is there for very high quality treated wastewater. It's going to be more costly and it's a question of what water you use to do what. And um, I think we're going to see outdoor watering increasingly not supplied by potable water. It could be rainwater harvesting, it could be people's individual gray water systems, it could be a system supplying treated wastewater. Okay, uh, where does agriculture and the environment fit in Arizona's water sustainability plans? David Major and Scott Olson visited with a farmer and an ASU ecologist to find out. Ron Rayner's family has farmed this land in Goodyear since 1946. Uh, on this farm, virtually all of the water uh, is groundwater uh, from pumps. This pump, one of five on the farm, can throw about 3,000 gallons a minute. It fills ditches with water to irrigate fields, fields of sorghum and wheat, alfalfa and cotton. The water quality is not that great, frankly, but it never has been. Uh, it's got high salinity, and that rather restricts our ability to grow crops, which crops we can grow. As a kid, Rayner was fascinated by the water that flowed from this well. I recall standing here and looking at this pump and the amount of water coming out of it, and I just couldn't understand how could there be that much water down there, and essentially would it run out? It never has. I've been doing this since 1946. <laughs> And to make sure it never will, the state passed the 1980 Groundwater Management Act. It established active management areas in the state where groundwater is regulated. The goal was to achieve safe yield by 2025. That means making sure groundwater is not used faster than it's replenished. Under the Groundwater Management Act, we're restricted on how much water we can use on each acre of the farm. 
Farmers have had to find more efficient uses of water. They line irrigation ditches with concrete, use lasers to level fields for a better distribution of water. Still, agriculture is Arizona's number one water user. Officials estimate it consumes about 70% of the state's water supply. Agriculture's use of water is declining. There's no question. Arizona's water resources are limited. For cities to grow, they need water, and quite often that means taking farms out of production. And once converted to municipal uses, farmland typically cannot be replaced. There's a risk in having agriculture be the default supply for water in the state, and that is uh, when you deal with food security. Rainer says farms provide other benefits. They're cool pockets of open space in an ever-expanding concrete jungle. And people need to remember the basic photosynthesis, what's occurring in this leaf every day, I guess before I picked it, is that it's taking in carbon dioxide and it's creating oxygen. We have a lot of these pollutants trapped in this uh, valley. Uh, maybe we're doing a, a service that we're not even charging for here, so you know we're, we're providing a service for free. But they also require a lot of water, and Arizona has only so much to go around. There's certainly a, a limit, you know, in uh, rancher terms, you know, this, this state has a carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity of the state, who knows what it is. Uh, I mean, in basic part, you know, it's going to be how much somebody is willing to pay to bring water here. Uh, and, and that's what it amounts to. It amounts to finding new sources of water or stretching our current supplies. Wastewater appears to have a lot of potential. The 91st Avenue Wastewater Treatment Plant in Phoenix already pipes about 57 million gallons a day to the Palo Verde Nuclear Power Plant for use as a coolant. The rest of the water is discharged into the Salt River bed. Some is diverted into irrigation canals. In fact, Rayner uses some of this treated wastewater to irrigate land he owns west of his Goodyear farm. We not only are reusing water, we're reusing it and reusing it and reusing it. But another interesting thing that's happening in the state is that there are many, what I like to call sort of accidental restorations, where municipal effluent, which is one of the few water sources in Arizona that's increasing as urban populations grow, um, in, in many areas, this treated wastewater, is, this effluent, is, um, is discharged into, the, into, into waterways where it creates or sustains a riparian ecosystem. ASU ecologist Julie Stromberg says about 100 miles of 35 waterways in Arizona are effluent dependent. These riparian and aquatic e ecosystems provide a lot of valuable sort of intangible services, um, recreation, aesthetics, um, you know, bird watching, and uh, they're in the, in the overall policy framework for water management in the state, the uh, environmental flows often do get overlooked. Stromberg and other scientists are investigating how much water is needed to sustain these ecosystems. <laughs> this area at the Salt River bottom in Phoenix was intentionally restored using mostly groundwater, but similar results can be achieved with treated wastewater. There really is a need to have environmental flow needs incorporated into statewide policy and planning so that it's one factor that's at the table when people are thinking about water for, uh, you know, for consumption, for agricultural use, for uh, industrial use. We need to have a, a chair there for, uh, for the environment, for environmental flows. Uh, Rita, as far as the ecology and the environment, as far as those concerns are concerned, are they often left off the table? Historically they were. Uh, in the last decade or two, we've really gone a long way to including the environmental issues in our discussions about water. And There's a laundry list of programs, uh, funds that are available now for environmental enhancement. Uh, and so they are now being considered, but in a sense you're trying to retrofit. Uh, uh, certainly when you talk about surface water, most of that water is fully allocated in Arizona. So when you try to build in um, a s source of water for environmental demands, you're having to reallocate supplies and commit them to this environmental restoration project. It's a good thing, but it takes a lot of effort and money to, to make those arrangements happen. And we also have, don't we, don't we have accidental riparian areas out there as well? Sure. I mean, we have one that, that we deal with quite a bit. That's the Cienega de Santa Clara in Mexico. It's, uh, um, largely accidental wetland that's uh, now a terrific habitat for endangered fish, endangered birds, and it was created because of an agreement to bypass some salty water down in the Yuma area uh, back in the mid-70s. 
Well, now we're in a situation where we can't really stop delivering that water. Uh, we've got to find uh, a solution to preserve that wetland in order to be able to, to do the things we'd like to do with managing our water resources in, in the Yuma area. Well, Please. Ted, I'd like to offer that I think while we've come a long way in recognizing the value of en environmental enhancement projects and the importance of these accidental recharge areas, um, there fundamentally are no protections for the environment in our state groundwater law. And um, I've been doing some work um, with Julie Stromberg and some others helping advise us on looking at bringing the environment to the table as a water using customer, having it be the slice in the water use pie. So we're not only talking about agriculture, municipal, industrial, but we also talk about environmental needs. It's hard to quantify. But we have examples where we have um, two things happening that together make for environmental uh, protection, and that is the Salton Verde watershed. You know, that Salt River project is very interested in preserving that watershed to serve water to central Phoenix in, in these areas. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. There are other states that are doing things to protect the environment more, more than Arizona is. I think we have to put that on the table. Uh, obviously, a big part of the table is concerned with agriculture, and we saw the, the example of photosynthesis and the idea that uh, agriculture doesn't just take a lot of water. There, it, it also adds flexibility to the water supply. Talk to us about that. Yeah, agriculture is a very important part of uh, the water budget in this state uh, because you can pay a farmer not to grow his crops in a year when drought is taking away available surface water supplies he or she will do just fine, uh, at least on a temporary basis. And then you can re-divert that water for municipal or industrial purposes. Uh, so agriculture provides some flex in the system. Uh, and, and so I think that's an important quality, and it helps keep the mix of water sources uh, mo much more flexible as water uh, demands change and as climate change. The, uh, we, I would hate to leave without mentioning uh, desalination. And, and that is some folks say it's far-fetched. Other folks say we should be doing it right now. Is it feasible? Certainly it's feasible. The, the question is cost. And there are different types of desalination. The one that's probably more promising in the short run for Arizona is what's called brackish or, or poor quality groundwater desalination. It's a lot cheaper than ocean water desal. Um, we have an abundant supply of poor quality groundwater here, even in the Phoenix area, in the Southwest Valley, other parts of the state. Um, that water can be treated to, to potable standards for roughly the same cost as it takes for um, uh, moving water from the Colorado River over to central Arizona. Be before we get going, I want to get a really quick response from you guys, all three of you. If there's a biggest concern, a biggest challenge right now for sustainability of water in Arizona, what is it? I would, I, I would say that it's not overusing our aquifers. Our groundwater supplies in some areas are abundant, other areas are not, and we are overusing them in many areas of the state, and I think we have to be very careful not to. What do you think? I think Sharon's right, but I also would make the point that there's a tension between rural Arizona and central Arizona. Uh, we are very good about managing our water supplies in central Arizona, but as rural Arizona grows, it too needs a water supply. What makes Phoenix an attractive place to live is the fact that other places in Arizona have water, and I think we need to remember that. Biggest concern? I'd say not being complacent, not believing that the answer is just to go out, uh, keep going out and getting more and more water, that there will always be enough water to meet demands. We're going to have to do more on reuse and conservation. All right. Great discussion. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it.